Well, good morning, everybody. Praise God. 
Um, as uh, we all get together, I trust that you are all well, guys, and that everything has been uh, fine. I pray uh, for those that have been able to receive my devotions uh, in the mornings, that that has been beneficial to you. Obviously, I want to encourage you that you're more than welcome to share it with whomever you feel may benefit from it. But um, guys, uh, what an awesome weekend uh, that lays ahead of us. You know, this morning, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, begin our celebrations. Uh, obviously, this, you know, it's, it's a little bit different this year. And uh, in a way, I'm really grateful that the Lord has been challenging us because, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we always need to remember is that our Christianity is, should never be defined by our buildings and, uh, you know, by a lot of the things that we sometimes do. Uh, and I'm not saying buildings are wrong or anything like that. I'm basically just saying, you know, that we tend to get into a rut. And, uh, you know, so it's good that God is changing things for us. So, you know, brothers and sisters, let us open up in prayer this morning as uh, we go before the Lord in word. And uh, uh, as we begin this weekend, we want to just thank the Lord for the worship. We want to thank him for uh, the prayer that has been going on. So, yeah, yeah, let us bow our heads as we go before the Lord in prayer. So, Father, we just want to thank you uh, just for this wonderful weekend, for this wonderful day. Lord, we know that, uh, you know, out there in the world that there are so many different uh, opinions or perspectives uh, to the significance of this particular weekend. But, Father God, we want to thank you that uh, this weekend that we refer to as followers of Christ, as Passover, we thank and praise you, my Lord, that for us, Lord, we understand what it truly means and the significance that it has had on our lives, the significance that it has had, uh, Lord, on the, on, on the course of history, on the course of the world and the universe in its entirety. Father God, we know that the events of 2,000 years ago, uh, Lord, that we celebrate in this weekend, Father God, have uh, dramatically, my Lord, changed and altered uh, uh, the course of where this world was going in relation in as a result of sin and degradation, Father God. So, Lord, we want to thank you that this weekend is a weekend of celebration. It is a weekend, Lord, yes, where we, um, Lord, where we take time to evaluate and to assess and uh, reflect on the significance uh, of, of what today, for example, represents to us as believers. And we thank you, Father God, that all of it ultimately results in one thing, that, that, that those who have put their faith in you, those who have received, my Lord, and responded to your gospel, my Lord, that they shall live. And Father God, we thank you, Father God, for the promises that are associated with that. Commit this morning to you. Pray that you would open up, and open up our minds and hearts to be able to receive the word this morning. But we thank you for this day of celebration and weekend of remembrance. In Jesus' name as we pray. Amen. Well, guys, um, you know, as we begin to look at this, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the, you know, today uh, on a Sunday morning, obviously, we will be having a service and our usual time at nine o'clock. And then again, we'll be celebrating Resurrection Day on uh, Monday morning at eight o'clock. Um, I, you know, again, I, I think what is important for me to communicate uh, from the beginning here this morning is this, is that, you know, for us as Christians, that this weekend is not some religious event. I think that is important. You know, for me, uh, many, many people practice religion, and uh, specifically uh, when it comes to their understanding and relationship with God, that the only time that we want to be spiritual is when, for example, this weekend comes along, which the world would often refer to as Easter, you know, you know, uh, throughout the you know throughout the year we live our lives, do you know, live lives completely indifferent to God. But when it comes to this weekend, you know, there are many many people that all of a sudden decide that it is now important to be religious. And 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 and, and, and you know what I want to say this more uh, uh, this morning to all of us and to remind all of us this morning is that you know Jesus never Jesus never died on the cross so that the events associated with the cross and his resurrection would become some religious event that we would participate in. You and I as believers know and should know the significance of what this weekend represents. And therefore, over this weekend, uh, we're going to be looking at it uh, under three uh, headings. Now, first of all, remember, as I go throughout this weekend and make references to 
the significance of this weekend, you will notice that the term that I use for this weekend is not Easter, but the term Passover. And the reason why that is, is, well, first and foremostly, is because Easter is not a biblical term. It is not a term anywhere in Scripture that should ever be associated with the significance of this weekend. Now, I don't have time to get into where this term Easter comes from, but all I want to say to everybody that is listening uh, to this is that for us that are truly followers of Christ, uh, the term Easter has absolutely nothing to do with the significance of what this weekend represents. That's the one thing I want to clear. The second thing that I want to highlight is the headings under which we really need to approach this weekend. Because obviously this weekend, we are celebrating and remembering the death, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there are three things that are important for us to focus on over this weekend. Number one, the significance of the cross that is associated with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Secondly, uh, what did Jesus do between his uh, crucifixion and resurrection? You know, the Bible tells us that he descended. And the question is, what was the object of what did he do? And obviously, on Monday, I am going to be dealing with that more specifically because I'll be dealing with two themes on Monday morning. Number one, what did Jesus do between his uh, crucifixion and resurrection? And then obviously you're going to be looking at the significance of the resurrection on Monday. Now, because of what we're going to be doing on Monday as we conclude this weekend, I would like to encourage you all to prepare yourself for communion. So on Monday morning, directly after we have presented the word, uh, we are going to have a time of communion. And I would like to ask you in your respective places to make sure that you have prepared communion elements so that you're able to engage. So, so, um, so this morning, I want to focus specifically uh, on, the, on, the, on the crucifixion of, the Lord, uh, of Jesus Christ. Now, first, the first thing that we, 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 we sometimes do not appreciate, and I think it gets lost, uh, uh, simply because of this religious mindset that is associated generally with this weekend in so many people's minds out there in the world in which we live today, is that we really do not sometimes uh, appreciate uh, uh, the dilemma that we uh, discover in regards to the Old Testament, in regards to the significance of this weekend. One of the things that we uh, learn throughout the Old Testament is that unless it was going to be uh, for God's intervention into uh, the state of affairs as far as the world and mankind was in concerned in regards to the rebellious act of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 that really uh, uh, brought all of creation, all of mankind into a sinful state uh, and the impact that that would have and has had on all of creation, uh, we, 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 it is very hard for us sometimes to appreciate the dilemma associated with that rebellious act, with that sin. And one of the things that we learn throughout the Old Testament is that, uh, that it was absolutely humanly impossible, number one, Number two, that there was no power in all of the universe outside of God, including the angels, uh, that in any way would ever be able to bring mankind into right relationship with God again. Because of what took place in Genesis chapter 3, all of creation, as, as referred to in Genesis chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, and all of mankind as a whole was destined for eternal separation from God. That's the reality. Sometimes we as Christians tend to forget that reality. And therefore, what the Old Testament reveals to us, and I'm trying to abbreviate everything to set the context for the resurrection this morning, what, what I am trying to condense here is to understand that because of sin and the impact that it has had on creation and more specifically on mankind, 
in the sense that because of sin, man was eternally separated from God. Now remember, whatever Adam and Eve enjoyed in the Garden of Eden prior to their fall, ultimately became a situation that was not a reality for all of mankind as a whole. Because when they enjoyed that relationship and that alignment with God under the Old Testament, it was because they were without sin and that the world was without sin. But because of the introduction of sin through their rebellious act as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, all of mankind, you and I included, were uh, destined to live a life separated from a holy God. Because this is the dilemma. The dilemma that we are introduced to in the Bible is that that God being holy uh, 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 and because of his holiness that there was a requirement that was needed in regards to dealing with sin. Now the, the Bible makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. But because God is holy, that it is important for us to remember that God cannot just pardon sin unless there is a substitutionary situation that takes place as a result of making that a reality. So when we come to the cross, what we need to be reminded of is this dilemma. And I want to read it out to you from my notes here so that I can communicate this clearly to everybody else. The question or the dilemma that is posed to us in the Old Testament is how can God be just yet pardon those who should be justly condemned? And therefore we need to understand that for you and I, brothers and sisters, uh, as sinners originally, all of mankind originally, every one of us really as we stood before holy God were justly in far as God's laws and far as God's holiness and as far as God was concerned, and here in relation to his positioning, every one of us would, uh, 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 would be condemned, and justly so. Amen? So the, the question that has been posed here is, how can God who is just pardon those who are justly condemned, and how can God be holy and yet befriend us who are evil? This is the dilemma. This is the question that was being posed in the Old Testament. Proverbs 17 verse 15 says, For he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them are alike and are an abomination to the Lord. Now what does the Bible reveal to us? That God cannot be contrary to himself. That, that God cannot be contrary to his holiness. God cannot be contrary to his justice. So therefore, here we sit with this dilemma. God's love compels him to reach out to, uh, to, to the sinner, but God's laws, God's justice, God's holiness demands that uh, justice be measured out in regards to the transgression of his own laws. So this is the dilemma that we sit of. So let us consider this thought. How then can the Lord justify sinners like us and still be just, still re uh, 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 remain holy, still remain just. Amen. And Romans 3 verse 26 says, To demonstrate at present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as I said at the beginning of my introduction here this morning very quickly, is that we, we are introduced to this overwhelming reality of this dilemma that I've made references to throughout the entire Old Testament. And the answer to the dilemma is not an angel. The answer to that dilemma is not some human-made religion. The answer to that dilemma is not some invisible influence that is out there in creation. No. The answer to that dilemma, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 26, is God himself. Only God was capable, number one, of putting a plan together and bringing it to pass that, number one, would retain his holiness, but at the same time give a way of escape to those who had transgressed his laws. And so therefore, the answer is God. 
And more specifically, the answer to this dilemma is the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross. And that's what we want to look at briefly this morning. If God, when we look and make references to this dilemma, if God were to act according to his justice, then the sinner must be condemned. If God pardons the sinner, then his justice is compromised. The answer to this dilemma can only be found in the gospel. And the gospel, brothers and sisters, to let us remind one another, is not the good news simply because it is the, you know, uh, the good news of something else. No. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul makes it very clear that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the answer to this dilemma that we learn in the Old Testament that not even the blood of goats and bulls could deal with because even the blood of goats and bulls could not bring you and I into right relationship with God as sinners. The only thing that could do this would be Jesus. The only thing that could, be, could, that could do this is what Jesus did on the cross. So as I have said, the answer to the dilemma, first and foremostly, is Jesus. Now, in this regard, is that Jesus would be our substitute. In other words, Jesus would be the one who would take our place for whatever judgment was measured and lined up for us. We were transgressors of God's laws and sinners in relation to God's holiness. As I said, God's wrath and His holiness demanded that uh, uh, sin be punished. The punishment that was ascribed to you and I as a result of our transgressions, Jesus would take upon himself. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that so whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have or receive everlasting life. 1 John 4, verses 8 and 10. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation, inverted commas, a substitute for our sins. Remember, the wages of sin is death. The, the sin, according to God's righteous law and God's holiness, had to be punished. Therefore, whoever who was going to stand in the gap for us and be our substitute had to be one who was willing to take our punishment, but also be one who was holy enough powerful enough, perfect enough without sin in order that the impact of that punishment would not have the same kind of ramifications on that individual than it would have had on us as sinners. Remember, if we died under the weight of our own sins or if we had died under the weight of our own sins without the blood of Christ in our lives, every one of us would be condemned to eternal separation from God and judgment and ultimately hell, punishment. Amen. But we have escaped that judgment because somebody else, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, was able to, uh, to be our substitute. John 15 verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than, uh, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Friends, brothers and sisters, as you listen to this, let us be reminded this morning that the reason why Jesus had to go to the cross as prophesied from the very first prophecy under the Old Testament. Throughout the entire Old Testament, hundreds of prophecies made it evidently clear that the Messiah, the Savior of all of mankind, would have to suffer on our behalf, would have to bear our sins, would have to bear the weight of the punishment associated with our sins. So therefore, Jesus, who he himself is God, him and him alone was willing and him and him alone was able to be 
uh, the pr our propitiation and our substitute in this matter. So, as we observe this reality, it is in justice God condemned humanity and demanded complete satisfaction for our crimes against him. However, in love, God took humanity upon himself, bore our sins, suffered the penalty we deserve, and died in our place. This is what we refer to as the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to re repeat that, and I want you to listen carefully. In justice, God condemned humanity and demanded complete satisfaction for our crimes against him, our transgressions against his holiness, against his law. But in love, God took humanity upon himself, bore our sins, suffered the penalty we deserve, and died in our place. This is the gospel. So brothers and sisters, this morning, Jesus Christ fulfilled both of these requirements, expressed both of these realities, the justice of God, number one, and number two, the love of God. So on the one hand, it is Jesus, our substitute, that has resolved the dilemma of a holy God in relation to sinful man as we speak. The second thing that we refer to is the cross. And uh, there are a couple of things that the cross communicates with us as we uh, uh, look at the, uh, uh, the latter part of how God deals with this great dilemma. Upon the cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, offered himself as a sacrifice for his people's sin. And, uh, and, and, and that is important. The cross is not an ornament. The cross has to be remembered in the context of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. That in his sacrificial act, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was taking our place and offering himself as a substitute, as a sacrifice in relation to death that was associated with sin. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Amen? Death had to be appeased on the cross. And Christ fulfilled that requirement on the cross. That's why if any man be in Christ, then he is a new creation. That is the condition to eternal life. That is a condition to salvation. And that's why you will realize the inadequacy of religion. Man's attempt to appease the holiness of God as defined. The only thing that it can appease the wrath of God that is directed against all sin and rebellion can be only the blood of Jesus Christ that was associated. And that's the real issue here this morning. So for us as believers, we are celebrating the fact of the goodness of God as revealed in Christ and the impact that it has had on us that have declared Christ as Savior and Lord. This is our celebration this morning. Furthermore, the answer to this great dilemma is in the fact that Christ bore our sin. God placed our sins on Christ's account and considered them his. Christ was declared guilty before the judgment throne of God and was treated as a guilty party. In Isaiah 53 verse 6, For all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, speaking Jesus, the iniquity of us all. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 13, And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning of the sixth day. In other words, all that is helping us to understand is that when God originally created the heavens and the earth, including mankind, he created it without sin. Sin did not come into this world by, uh, by, uh, uh, by, anything, by any other act except 
the act of man himself. Every one of us needs to understand that ultimately at the end of the day, sin was never part of God's plan, never part of God's intention, never part of God's creation. However, because God was all-knowing, he knew in advance the manner in which we would react and respond. And that opens an entire discussion of which we don't have time to get into. But we must remember, however, that by this sin, we were all by nature morally corrupt, inclined towards evil, and even hostile towards God and his righteousness. So Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 says, Truly this I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Jeremiah 17 verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? Matthew chapter 5 verse 19, For out of the heart proceed of evil thought, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witnesses, and blasphemies. Isaiah 64 verse 6, But we are like unclean things. And all our righteousness is like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Romans 8 verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. My friends, what is the reality? The reality is this. The Word of God, the Bible, reveals very clearly to all of mankind, including you and I, that every one of us, the fact is in thought, in our words, in our deeds, will continually and do continually break the laws of God. Now, obviously, I'm referring to two groups of people here. I'm referring to the one group who are in right relationship with God, that are followers of Christ, and I'm referring to another group that are not in right relationship with God, that the Bible refers to as sinners. But all of us, before at one time in our lives were sinners so our thoughts our emotions our actions our words were continually in opposition to god's laws in other words every one of us were guilty as charged in relation to the laws of god and therefore the emphasis coming back to all of our thoughts, all of our sins, all of our deeds. Why do we celebrate this weekend? Because all of the punishment and the wrath of God associated against those deeds that we practiced in rebellion to God, Christ took upon the cross so that you and I would, would not uh, 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 have to be able to carry that uh, and, and to be subject to that judgment. That's why we rejoice this morning. All of us, under the law of God, were guilty and condemned. So all of us, without exception, are sinners by both nature and by deeds that we have committed. All of us stand guilty and without excuse before God. Jesus came for sinners and not for the self-righteous. If you acknowledge your sin and grief, then God's wisdom has solved your great and uh, 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 this great problem or this great dilemma in the most remarkable way. So my friends, the answer to this dilemma is in the cross that Christ has bore our sins. Amen? And, and that Christ has taken our place. That Christ suffered on the cross for the sake of the curse, for the sake of the suffering that you and I were supposed to suffer because of our transgressions. Galatians 3 verse 10. For as many are the works of the law under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So in other words, according to the law of God, because all of us have transgressed the law, there was a curse associated with the transgressions of that law. But Christ has become that uh, as Christ has become that curse for us. In other words, so that you and I who have received Christ as Lord are no longer cursed. This is the point. Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that lives, uh, that hangs on, on the tree. Amen? 
Furthermore, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dilemma in relation to this dilemma that we found ourselves in relation to our sinful state in relation to a holy God was answered because Christ was forsaken in our place. In other words, but your iniquities in Isaiah 59 verse 2 have separated you from God and your sins have hidden your face, uh, his face from you so that he will not hear you. Speaking about the cause and effect of our sins in relation to a holy God. Matthew 27 verse 46, notice what happened on the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right there, friends, right there, Christ took our place on the cross. Christ was forsaken on the cross so that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, whoever will come into right relationship with God, will no longer be forsaken by the Lord. We rejoice this morning as followers of Christ that we are not forsaken, but that we have been brought into a living relationship and can refer to God our Father. Furthermore, Christ on the cross took our place and paid the price and suffered the wrath of God in our place. God in Psalm 7 verse 11 it says, God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. Jeremiah 25 verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel to me, Take the wine cup of my fury from my hand and cause all nations to whom I send you to drink of it. Speaking about his wrath associated with his anger that is directed against all rebellion and sin. Matthew 26 verse 39. And he went a little further and fell upon his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 42. And again a second time he went away and prayed, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup, uh, if, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we are esteemed him, we yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This chastisement for our peace upon him. By his stripes we are healed. My friends, brothers and sisters, as we rejoice, as we remember this weekend, let us remember that the cross reveals the sufferings of Christ, that all of God's anger directed against all of sin and all those who have committed sin was carried, poured out upon Christ on that cross so that you and I, who have embraced Christ, brothers and sisters, would not have to endure the anger and the wrath of God is directed against sin, God's sin, except uh, uh, sorry, that in, in instead of that, you and I would experience the love of God. So, as I conclude this message this morning, simply put, Christ died in our place. Everything about the cross of Christ needs to remind us what you and I deserved. Friends, there is none righteous. There is none who can say they have not sinned. There is none of us that can ever turn around and say, we did not deserve the full of wrath of God against our lives. So we must remember this morning, as we think about the significance of this weekend and what it represents to us, that everything associated with that cross simply means this, that the cross reminds me that that should have been me dying and paying the price of the sins that I have committed in my life. But instead of that, God, who loved me, made a way of escape, thereby fulfilling his righteous requirements as far as his justice was concerned, but at the same time, through his love, befriending me and you that were originally sinners. I want us to consider that. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. 
Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but, of, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, for the just and for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour, or sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. For all of you that are listening to this message this morning, whether you are a follower of Christ, whether you are not, whether you are in right relationship with God or whether you are not, I want you to know something this morning. Jesus died in your place. Jesus died for your sins. However, the only requirement for you and I to be able to receive what Christ has done on the cross for us has to be a personal acknowledgement on our behalf. God has done everything for all mankind, all mankind, so that, no, so that number one, none of us are without excuse, and, none, and number two, so that every one of us would have an opportunity to come into right relationship with God. Religion cannot save you. Religion cannot bring you into right relationship with God. The only thing that can bring you into right relationship with God is Jesus Christ. Christ himself. So this morning, as we close in prayer, all I want to ask you is, are you in right relationship with God? You know, you know that. You know in your heart of hearts, you know it in your mind, you know it in your lifestyle, whether you are in right relationship with God. And if you're not in right relationship with God this morning, this morning I want to pray for you, and I want you to pray with me, and to lead you into a prayer that will help you to come into right relationship with God. The condition is acknowledge that you are a sinner. Acknowledge that because of that sin, you're not in right relationship with God. Acknowledge this morning that Jesus and Jesus alone can save you. And acknowledge that you are willing to make him the Lord of your life. If you're willing to do that this morning, pray with me. Let us pray together. Father, as I stand before you this morning, my God, I acknowledge with my heart, with all my mind, and all my understanding, and I confess openly before you that I have fallen short of your glory, that I have sinned, that I have sinned against you and you alone. I have transgressed your laws. I have desired things that have an abomination to you. I have rebelled against you in my thoughts. I have rebelled against you in my heart. I have rebelled against you in my life. I have been indifferent to you, my God. And therefore, I acknowledge that if you were to condemn me, you would be rightly, that you would be upright in your judgments. So therefore, as I come before you, I beat on my chest, I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge my sin and declare that I have sinned against you. And I ask you, my God, through your provision in Jesus Christ to save me from my iniquities, to cleanse me from my unrighteousness, and to bring me into right relationship with God. And therefore, this morning, I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, the Lamb of God who come, came to take away the sins of the world. And therefore, Jesus, by faith, with the confession of my lips and with all my heart, I ask you to come into my life, to be my Savior, and to redeem me and to set me free from all those iniquities that were ascribed to my name. Because, Lord, you have taken my place. I receive it by faith this morning. And therefore acknowledge and surrender my entire life to you. 
And I ask you that from this day on forward, you would be the Lord of my life and the center of everything as I commit my entire life to you this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you for saving me. Well, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I want to remind you that you are in right relationship with God this morning. Through that prayer, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That if you confess with your lips and believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. My friends, I want to rejoice with you this morning that Jesus took your place and because of your confession of faith and your acknowledgement of Christ as Savior and Lord, today, as you celebrate this weekend, you celebrated not you celebrate, excuse me, as a child of God. You celebrate it in the fact, in the reality that you are no longer bound by sin, no longer bound by the devil, no longer a slave to him, but that you have become a child of God. For all of us, my friends, that are in right relationship with God, let us be reminded of what Christ has done for us. Let us examine ourselves throughout this day. Let us be reminded where we come from. Let us be reminded in what, in what God or what Jesus has introduced us into today. And let us live for the glory of God as we live for it. Amen. So guys, let me remind everybody that we will continue on Sunday morning with our service at 9 o'clock. On Monday morning, we'll com continue with Resurrection Day, and then we're going to conclude this weekend through communion. But as we go and take time this weekend, let us dedicate this weekend to a time where we truly worship the Lord and that we be reminded of His goodness and His love and that which He has allowed us to become part of. And let us rededicate our lives throughout this weekend to the proclamation of the gospel. My friends, let me remind you, there are many out there, many out there who still have not responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ for two reasons. Number one, they may have heard it and have yet not responded. Or number two, they have not heard it and therefore do not know how to come out of the situation. The answer to that dilemma is you and I. Remember, this is the reason why the church exists. Remember, this is the reason why we are discipled, we learn the Word of God, why we are equipped. Not so that we can become religious and do religious rituals. No, so that we can go out there and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let Passover this weekend have an impact that is beyond just your life. Let it impact you and let it have new meaning as you share the gospel with those that are out there in the world. God bless, love you, and have an awesome, awesome weekend. See you on Sunday morning. See you on Monday morning. Blessings.